so thankful for being able to be a part of, of this and just be an instrument that God would use that just to be a, a weapon. I love to be a weapon of righteousness for the Lord. I love to be, I used to be a, an instrument of sin, but I became a weapon of righteousness. I became a weapon of the Lord, fit for the master's use, in the master's hands. And one of the, one of the most, the amazing, I would say, the most amazing strength of, of being a weapon in Christ is being, being humble. I don't know another, I don't know another gospel. Can be real dangerous when you, when you get to share your heart when you, if it becomes about this because even though I'm a weapon and an instrument of righteousness this, if it becomes about a pulpit with a lot of people I'm in trouble I've got the opportunity to share in, in front of so many people but if I lose the reality of standing before my father every day it's all for nothing and then it'll be about pleasing bunches of people and, and appeasing the crowd and, and swaying the crowd with this or that. But it's never about that. It's never been about that. It's always been since the beginning about Him and about just having a love relationship with Jesus and being in love with Him. People always ask me, how do you, how, Todd, how can you, you've only this old in Jesus, how can you do the things you're doing? And I said, because I've been in love with Jesus since day one. I don't know. It's just being in love with Jesus. I promise, guys. But I don't count it any more of a privilege to be in front of 100,000 people than I do to be in front of one person wherever I'm at because it's the same privilege because God loves each and every individual with, with His amazing love and with His amazing grace, with His amazing mercy. He loves each individual that way. So when you're in front of 100,000 people, He loves 100,000 individuals with His love. But if I don't know it for me, I might try to perform for them. And I can't afford to. The last time I looked it up, the last time I was here was in December. And so many things have happened since December. It's just crazy. I mean, even the day that I left here in December, I think it was December, Harold came up and he told me, he said, when you were here, you're talking about this and talking about that and, and about how you touch people everywhere you go and waitresses and love on waitresses. And he says, I guess his son works in TSA in the airport. See, I don't play with this thing, man. I tell everybody that I can, no matter where I'm at, about Jesus. And when I left here, I went to go to the airport to fly out. And I guess his son was there. And I just shared Jesus with him because that's all I know how to do. It's really important that we would be vocal about what we believe, that we wouldn't be so concerned about the people as much as we concerned about being His people. It's so overwhelming to me that we've complicated it and we've made it something more than that. But really, it is about that. It's about God's love for me, His, my love for Him, my love for me, because I see His love for me and my love for you out of that right there. Love the Lord thy God with all my heart, my strength, my soul, my mind, and then love my neighbor as myself. But I can't love you unless I love me. And I can't love me unless I believe that Jesus paid the price he paid and what he really did on the tree and what he did through resurrection to make me become a witness. I just want to read a section of scripture and then I want to share some stuff with you. You guys okay? I want to kind of share how, how God is before us. He's before us. He's after us. He precedes us. He's way bigger than you think. Like God makes this thing way easy. Like I've been in places and I'll go to share something with somebody, but God's already been there. And sometimes we think that we've got to get everything amped up and we've got to try to like figure out where to go, where do you want to go. God, only if you're led by God can you go and we forget the reality of just going. Sometimes we super spiritualize this thing and we think, okay, well I need to ask the Lord where He wants me to go today. And we forget that you've got to go shopping someday. <laughs> like no matter where you're going, like God's bigger than what you think and He's on it. He's really ahead of stuff. 
He is. Sometimes we think we need to be led, and the Bible says those that are led by the Spirit, they are sons. But I don't believe that Jesus was some kind of like robot that, that, that was like, I, I believe that he walked in relationship and God was with him and through him and he flowed through him on a constant basis. And we need to set our mind on the right thing so that we can think from the right place. So that we can be in the world but not of it. Let me just read it. It's in Colossians 3. It's powerful. Let me just read and then we'll go somewhere. You guys all right? This is one of my favorite places to read because it just sums it all up. It's just awesome. I don't know if you guys have read Colossians 3, but it's very powerful. It's, to me, it's amazing. And this is where I just I feed on this. There's times when I've been on an airplane. And I've been on an airplane. I've been on lots of airplanes, actually. I live on airplanes. They're like my home. I fly 300,000 miles a year. That's like a lot of airplanes. So that's a lot of time in the sky right locked in a steel tube with people <clears throat> but there are times when I'm on an airplane for seven hours or nine hours and then other times I'm going to Australia which is triple it lots of hours 30 hours on a plane that's a long time to be flying in the air people are like what do you do well I minister to people but I, I get in the Word and I ask God. So there's times where I'll actually plug into Colossians 3 or just one section of Scripture because to me, it's really hard for me to grab like 10 books like of the Bible. I have to focus on something small. That's why I love the iPad because when I pull a page up, that's all I see. I don't see a big book. I just see one page right there. And I just flip it over like a page and the next page is there. And it's not this... Okay, so I'm, I'm on there, and there are times that for 10 hours straight, I'm in one section of Scripture, just one, and can't get out of it. I just can't. It's crazy. So I'm stuck there, or I'm, I'm working out, I'm exercising at a, wherever I'm at, in the hotel, whatever, and I, I, I listen to the audio, I listen to the Word, I have it in my ears, I have it before my eyes, I watch the visual Bible, same story with me, guys, it hasn't changed, it's just gotten more intense, and He's speaking to me more but I read the same things over and over. And this section of scripture, I've probably, man, I've read it thousands and thousands of times, listened to it thousands and thousands of times. And it, it blossoms and does something in me different every time. Is that, I don't know if that makes sense. We have to develop a love for the word of God because without it, we have no gauge of truth. We can't afford to press into the things of the spirit and not have a love for the truth. We have to, we have, to have the spirit and the truth because it's the spirit and truth. We can't afford to press into the Word more than we have relationship with the Holy Spirit or we think we get it all with our head and our brain. And then all of a sudden we become theologically sound but top heavy. And we can't afford to be top heavy. The Holy Spirit is the empowerer of the Word but the Spirit of God allows the Word of God to become alive, sharp and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, separates my soul from my spirit so that my soul isn't top heavy. My soul, my mind, my will, my emotions need to be so filled with the things of God that I can have my mind set on God on a constant basis. I talked about it yesterday for those of you that weren't here last night. I talked about 1 Corinthians 2 where it talks about the, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom, the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of this age. And it talks about the powers and the principalities. If they would have known what they were doing, they wouldn't have done what they did, but they did. They crucified the Lord in Christ because they didn't have any idea that what they were doing. See, the Satan knows how to steal, kill, and destroy. So he thought, kill him, get him out of the way. But when he killed Jesus, he put us all in the way. But if we don't understand what we've been put into, because the mind that we're carrying is the mind of the world, which needs to be completely dominated by the mind of Christ. See, Jesus paid more of a price than just to get me to heaven, and we're growing into that. He paid a price to get heaven into me, but he paid a price for me to no longer think along the way that seems right to a man. He paid a price for me to think along the way that is right to God. See, God, God, didn't, God didn't just give us a piece of his mind. He's literally given us his mind. 
He didn't just give us a piece of his mind. Like we hear that all the time. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Well, you're not allowed to give them a piece of your mind. That comes from attitude. If you're going to give somebody a piece of your mind, make sure it's the mind of Christ. Because that's where you need to give up. Because your war is not against people. It's against principalities. It's never against the person in front of you. It's like way more beautiful and way more awesome than that. This love relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, it really starts with us saying yes to him. But it's an ongoing relationship to where our yes becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden we're trained and we learn from him. We actually come to him and we learn from him. Not just get born again one time and have a confession, but it's an ongoing relationship to where we learn from him. To where the rest that we carry is the rest that is the rest of Jesus. It says be diligent to enter into his rest. Beware 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 actually fear the fact that you might have come short of it it says that it's in it's in it's it's just amazing it's all over the bible hebrews really just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds but it talks about it in hebrews 3 and it says you know <clears throat> In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers, they tested me, where they saw my works, but they didn't know my ways. God has given us the ability to know his ways. We don't have to just know his works. We don't have to just press in to the works of God, to the miraculous, because if we know his ways, his ways will become your ways, your ways become his ways, and you start to think from a different set of rules. It's the royal law of love, the royal law of liberty. In James it talks about it, but it's the love God with all my heart, my strength, my soul, and my mind. Jesus adds it to it, the first commandment, love God with my mind, and then love my neighbor as myself. But if you don't understand what mind you've been given, you'll think according to the carnal mind and the way that seems right to a man, and never ever think from the way that is right to the Father. You have become right with God, the God of the universe, God that created everything, all things. I mean, scientists have like, they can see, I don't even know, trillions of light years ahead, like out there, the galaxies that are out there. And God created this minute place, this little tiny place, and he placed his creation there. Why did he do that? Because God's glory, he's glorious. But the reality of God's glory is supposed to be released in us, through Christ in us, the hope of glory and if we don't understand who we've been created to be you'll think that your life is a bummer instead of being glorious we get to release the glory of God everywhere we go but if we don't understand what we've got you will be dependent upon somebody getting healed to make you okay and that's not what makes you okay what makes you okay is the reality that Jesus paid a price to set you free from hellish thinking you can't afford to think like a carnal man. You can't afford to think like a mere man. You have to think like your father thinks. Are you guys okay? I've got a couple of people that are really excited about this. I am. I am really excited about it because I live this way. You know, I haven't had the days of condemnation, guilt, or shame. I haven't had the offense where I get offended and hurt by people. It's still the same. People told me you can't keep talking like that. Well, I'm gonna. People told me, well, you, well, let's see where you are in 10 years. Well, now it's been 11. I just don't even want to hear all that stuff. I've just been in a place of surrender and a love relationship with my dad. He loves me. Like, I still got the same daisy, and it still didn't run out of petals. Still got the same ones. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. It, it, they just keep growing out. Once I get around to it, they're, they're there again. It's never changed, but right standing is the love of God for me. He loves me, but He loves you the same as He loves me. It's the simple cross. It's the simple Jesus message. He so loved the world that He gave His Son, so that whoever believes in Him, believes means to be absolutely, like fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. Actually, the word belief, they use the example, and it says a house with no empty rooms. And then it uses a bigger example and it says like a town with no empty houses. So a house with no empty rooms, which means that my belief is fully occupied with faith in the risen one. Faith in the one that was crucified and resurrected, the one-two punch of God. He was, 
Delivered up for my offenses. One punch. Bam. But then the uppercut. He was raised for my justification. That's the uppercut of heaven to the devil. He justified me with the Father just as if I never ate the tree. Just as if I never sinned. And that's what I see every day. I don't see a man that wants to sin and get away with it. I see a man that's right with God that has no draw to sin anymore. When I got saved, the reality of the truth of God hit my heart and God told me that, Todd, you're not allowed to live with sin consciousness anymore because I've given you a different consciousness. It's called sun consciousness. Sin consciousness makes me aware of my faults, my failures, and my sin. Sun consciousness makes me aware of my father. Sin consciousness is what happens before you get saved. You're conscious of your sin, and then all of a sudden the cross comes, you look at it, huh, and you see the reality of God's love for you, and the goodness and mercy of God leads you to repentance. See, sin consciousness produces regret, and regret produces death, and that's in Corinthians. But sun consciousness produces godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is amazing. Godly sorrow is, I wish I never did that stuff. And God says, great, because it's as if you never did. Sin consciousness says, man, I can't believe that stuff I did. But there's no awareness of the freedom that's in Christ. There's no awareness and belief in the blood of Jesus and the transforming nature of the blood that crushes and kills the carnal nature so that you can live by the divine nature. Sun consciousness is being conscious of my sonship. It's like when I tell people, I went to AA and, and hi, my name's Todd and I'm an alcoholic. That's what AA says, or hi, or with, with Narcotics Anonymous, which was the one that I did more because I was more into the drugs and the alcohol. It was all part of it. I was addicted. So hi, my name's Todd and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Or hi, my name's Todd and I'm a recovering you know, drug addict. Hi, Todd. <laughs> but it's different. See, when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, my confession doesn't just say, hi, my name's Todd. People say, how long have you been clean? But when people say clean, say, well, well, let, me, let me talk to you about what you believe clean really is. So how long have you been sober? Oh, man, I'm sober all the days of my life. I'm, I'm sober every day because the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. He's looking for whom he can destroy. There are words that trigger the truth in me. There are words that trigger it. When I, when I hear the word world, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm not of this world. When I hear the word freedom, I'm like, whom the sun sets free is free. You see, when I hear these words, when I see numbers on clocks, when I see 1010, I'm like, oh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give me life and life more abundantly. When I see 220, when it comes up on the clock, I look at it and say, oh, man, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But the life that I do live, I live for the one that gave himself for me. When I see 633, I think, oh, Matthew 633. Wow, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. That's how I think on a constant basis. These things trigger me. All the time. People say stuff and all of a sudden this picture rolls through me. Of the word, of the truth. I'm possessed. I really am. And this is how I think all the time. There's no triggers that trigger bummer in me. None. Because that guy's dead. See, but we have to believe the reality of the cross that that thing's finished. And once you come to God, He washes that thing as if it never existed. But the devil never wants you to remember that God forgave you. He wants you to forget that part. And he wants to whisper to you and say, well, you know, if you, really, if you really were forgiven, then you wouldn't be thinking about that anymore. Well, you know, if God really did forgive you, then why would he bring it up again? Why would he? He's not bringing it up again. Come on. The Bible says that God knit me in my mother's womb. He said he knit me there. I read in Galatians, I was reading there where Paul was, Paul was talking in there, and it says they glorified the God in me. But right before that, it says, God who called me from my mother's womb imagine if a person knew that regardless of where their life was and how many times they'd messed up whether it's 30 40 50 10 years whatever no matter how many years that god called you 
from your mother's womb. That whole rejected in your mother's womb thing would be crushed in out the window. Because my mom didn't know who I was when I was born. So she said things. She said things because she didn't know who she was. So my mom said, you know, I, man, we're not ready for this. We're not financially ready. I don't know what I'm going to do. My dad tried to do the best that he could know what, that he could do with what he had, but he didn't have Jesus. So he can only do too much. You can do too much that the world has to offer, or so much the world has to offer, but you can't do God's stuff. And you can't think God's way. Man, and even Christians that don't know who they are, when they get into situations like that, and they're not ready... They say things that they wish they'd never said because their soul's not right. But when the Word of God comes, it's alive and sharp and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it divides and separates your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions from your spirit, all of a sudden the Spirit of God communicates with your spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, the depth of God is revealed to the Holy Spirit because He is the Spirit of God. And who knows the depth of God except the Spirit that is from God? And who knows the deep things of man except the Spirit that's in a man? But when you get born again, all of a sudden, one Spirit happens. And you've got this communion thing going on with Holy Spirit and your spirit. And He reveals all truth of God's Word. It really is the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. And he reveals it to your spirit. Your spirit, man, gets it. Your mind is like... Because it's been trained by the world. See, we weren't just born into sin. We were cultivated by the very enemy of God. Our minds were trained by the liar. Our minds were trained by deception. Even if you grew up in the church, if you haven't pressed in to relationship on your own, you still have been trained by the world. Because you will come to church on a Sunday to try to get fed and depend upon your pastor to take you someplace that Jesus wants you to learn from Him. You can't afford to live that way. Even though pastor's amazing, his responsibility isn't to keep you hooked up to the Father. Jesus paid a price so that you could plug your fingers in like a light socket to heaven itself and you can learn from the Father. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down and weighed down by life. Come to me, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. So we come to Jesus and we're happy with the rest that we get at the altar, but then we leave and we're stressed out and we're pottered and molded by life. Because we never get to the second part of the scripture. The most amazing part of Christianity is union and communion with Holy Spirit. The truth that God has told me this and that and this. And my identity does not depend upon what the world thinks of me. But my identity depends upon what the Father says about me. Faith doesn't come by reading. Faith comes by hearing. We need a relationship with the Father where we can constantly hear. And Jesus bridged the gap. So that we could actually be hooked up to the Father. He loves us. He loves us. And that's not tingly and goosebumps because of a song. That's not coming to church and being so excited that you're at church and finally your week is over. No, you've got to begin as soon as you leave here. But you've got to carry Jesus with you wherever you go. The peace of God that surpasses understanding. It's amazing, but you've got to give up your right to understand it, to have it. What? Jesus said, peace I have to give you, not peace like the world gives. The world can't give you what I've got. See, we have peace in situations that sometimes we have this happiness that comes from worldly situations. But man, that's rare and far in between. I don't know who... There's... Nobody has a constant peace in life from worldly situations. We're not talking about like meditation, empty your mind of everything. Because you know what? It's not meditation, empty your mind. It's empty, it's, it's empty your mind of the world and fill your mind with the things of the gospel, the truth of who Jesus says, so that we can start to think different. What would it be worth to you? What would it be worth to you to gain peace from the world and gain everything here and, and forfeit your own soul? What profit is it? To gain everything here and to build your little kingdom here that looks like you and what you've created, but not have peace with God. It's not worth anything. 
Nothing. It's not worth it. And people are dying and people are hurting. And everywhere we go, we see those people every day. And we can't afford to be a hurting, dying people that try to minister to people that are hurting and dying. Because what we'll do is we'll try to work something up to say something to them to help them. But if I don't have peace, period, inside because of Christ in me, the hope of glory, the reality of the finished work of God, I will try to muster something up so that I can do something good so I finally feel good about myself. And it's not about your works that make you feel good about yourself. It's about the grace and love of God that He paid a price when you were yet a sinner. Christ died for you. Christ did. Sometimes it's hard for us to even see God as a father. And to say, Father, well, that's great news for you. Guess what? Galatians 4 says that the Holy Spirit has been poured out into our hearts by faith. And He cries out, Abba, Father, for us. The Holy Ghost inside of us cries out, Papa, Daddy God. And who knows the deep things of God except God Himself and the Holy Spirit that's in Him. And now he's in you and we're hooked up to that very same thing, that same relationship, that same intimacy that Jesus Christ had is yours. That's yours. What are you doing with it? Because people are dying, man. We can't afford to be a church that's saved but lost. We can't afford to be a people that don't know who we are, that wonder when your time is coming. Your time came when you said yes to Jesus. But if your joy isn't there, you might have just come to him for a confession and then wonder where God is. He never left you. We just haven't grown in our identity and who God says we are. Jesus says, learn from me. Learn from me. First part of the scripture. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down, and I will give you rest. Boom. So we do. We realize we were lost. And then we have this moment of emotional freedom and found and it's awesome and it is awesome I'm not taking any way, anything away from it it's like incredible but if that moment isn't followed by relationship you're in trouble relationship means that Jesus says oh and take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am lowly and gentle and meek Learn from me, Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's where we need to be. That's where we need to go. That's where we live from. That's where we move. We live, move, and have our being in. Are you ready? We'll start preaching now. had a little explosion but we're okay now everything's all right I see something and I see it really clear and I've seen it since the beginning of my Christ walk but all it is is relationship and it's not complicated if it was I couldn't get it If it was, Jesus wouldn't say, become like a child. We allow our learning and our our full-on wanting to learn and books and all these different things. And I'm not against books, man, but so many people read books because they can't get in here. Because this Bible, it's not just a a book for reading. I've had so many people, countless people on planes and all. I read the Bible. Yeah, I already did. But it was written by men. And, and inside of me, I've got fireworks going off, man. Not like explosions and anger. Just the word. You know the ones that go off and it's, all you hear, all you see is a, and you know it's one of those, one of those big ones that are just the blast of white light. No, no, like colors. Those things go off in me all the time when someone says that. Now, not to be, for me to explode, but the truth is going, the truth is going off in me. And it takes everything in me to hold that back. (laughs) I feel like I'm going to explode. It's constant. I've got this buildup of the love of God that's in me and the truth of who God says we are. That in every situation, I'm waiting to erupt. I'm not waiting to counter what you're saying. 
But God loves you and I know his love for me. And if I know his love for me, then I know his love for you. Like I know God's love for me, how much he loved me, how lost I was and how found I am. I'm not lost anymore. Like he, he's like my shepherd. I'm a sheep. Meh. I'm hanging with him every day. Constant. It's a constant thing. Constant. But, but just like that shepherd, how he's lowly and meek. And hey, come on, let's go. He knows my name, man. He knows your name. He knows everything about me. He's not mad. He's not bummed out. He's excited. He's like really tripping. <laughs> he really does. He really does. He knows you all. He sees you. You're not just a number. You're important to him. He's not mad at you. He loves you. You're like, like I said yesterday, you're like the treasure in a field. Buried deep in muck sometimes. But God, he, he gave up everything. He gave up everything just to have that treasure. I was reading that book to my kids. I can't get over it. It's like a child's story, but I'm overwhelmed on the couch trying to read it to my kids, and I can't, I'm crying. I'm like, oh my God. What, Daddy? Nothing. Well, they open the treasure, and there's rubies and diamonds and all that. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> because that's what God sees in us. <laughs> he sees what we're created for. See, God knows the end from the beginning. He, he sees it all. He knew where you came from. He knit you there. But He knew you'd be lost. He knew you'd be floundering around. He knew you'd be flopping. And He was totally cool with giving up His Son anyway. Like, God's not rattled like we are. He's not a man that He should lie. His word is truth. He's like possessed by it. He is truth. He is love. Love that God is is different than the love that we've learned. Because sometimes the love that we've learned, it's not, it's not the love of God. It's the love of the world. It's the love from people. You do this and I'll do that. If you don't do that, then I'm not doing this. If you tell me, then I'll tell you back. If you don't tell me, you ain't getting it again. I sweep the floor, boss. If you like it, you'll give me a raise. I'll do that a couple of times, but I don't get no raise. I ain't doing nothing for you. That's the world. That's the world. But that's not the world that you live in. And if you're depending upon your job to give you a raise because of your production, you're living, accord you're living according to the customs and principles of this world. And the Bible says that you're supposed to die to that stuff. That doesn't mean quit your job. That just means work for another. That doesn't mean quit your job and work for another. That just means that know that no matter how heinous and angry and, and horrible your boss is, your employer is, your family is, you're supposed to walk in the midst of a corrupt and perverse generation and shine as a light no matter where you go. And no one should be able to put out your light, man. You are to blaze an inferno of light and love. The reality of Jesus everywhere you go so that people around you can get rocked because you didn't respond the same way everybody else responds. And when trial hits and crisis hits, you're in crisis and you're in love, so it's different. It's just different. I go through stuff, horrible stuff, constantly. Why? Because I'm in the same world you are. I'm just not of it and I'm living from a different place. I am a pilgrim and I am passing through. I am a sojourner. I'm a pilgrim. I am not of this world. And you are not either. And it's time that we wake up and see what world we're really living from. Because you can't afford to live here and be like it. God's looking for people that would just love Him with everything they are. Their heart, their soul, their strength, their minds. And they would actually love their neighbors themselves. Even if you have neighbors with attitudes, because we just talked about that this morning too. I, I brought up Walt. We shared about Walt today. He loves me. He just doesn't know it yet. I've had some Jesus conversations with him. You know what he told me when I told him that we're going to move? My neighbor. We've been there for 17, 20 years. Long time. I've been with you 20 years. Just kidding. I have. This year will be 20. 
that I've been with my girl. I said to him, I said, man, we're going to move. He goes, well, he says, uh, how's that preaching gospel stuff going for you? I said, it's amazing, man. I love you. He goes, oh, I know. <laughs> I said, we're going to move. He goes, wow. He goes, where are you going? I said, Texas. He said, Texas is a nation. We're going to go down there to around Dallas. And he's like, what, what brings you there? He says, this message I said yes sir that's all he knows and I said isn't it awesome and he goes well maybe you can talk to the next people and they can tolerate me like you have I said man I ain't tolerate you I love you I know I just make sure they know what kind of person I am <laughs> I said that's silly there's hope for everyone I said come here man give me a hug oh you just don't know it, but uh, it's awesome it's fun alright let me read what I said I was going to read didn't even read it ready I'm just going to cruise through this here and oh my probably not going to get too far but let's just go for it ready if you were raised with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God see all kinds of scriptures when I'm reading like you know how you have reference Bibles? Sometimes you can press the number in it, or if you have an iPad, or it has references in there, A, B, C, D. You can go to different ones. I, I highly suggest that they would be, that that would be something we'd use as a tool. Um, but the scripture in Ephesians that says that, therefore, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. In Ephesians 2, it, it talks about being seated, but it talks about being, die, being dead, but being alive in Him. So it says, set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Set your mind on things above. And in that 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when, it's, when it was talking about who, what knows the things of God, the deep things of God, but yet the spirit that's from God. He knows the depth of God. And, and what, thing, what, what knows the depth of man except the spirit that's in a man? So the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. And my spirit knows the deep things of me. And God's word just just completely saturates me with everything that God is are you with me but it says who can know the ways of the Lord his ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts but at the end of that chapter it actually said but we have the mind of Christ so it actually says that we have been given the mind of Christ and it says set your thing set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God for when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion. who we could go after all this stuff. Evil desire and covetousness, which is, idol which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That you yourselves, listen to this, that you yourself once walked in. You used to walk in that stuff. But then you got saved. Not just a confession. But your mind got filled with truth and you're in a relationship with Jesus. Because all that stuff, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, is opposition to the reality of what you gave yourself to. But if you don't start to learn who God says you are, that stuff is normal. And even though you don't want to do it, you do it. And even though you will not to, you do it anyway. And it's sin in you that's doing it. That's sin consciousness. Hear me on this one. Are you ready? Romans 7 talks about sin consciousness. And it talks about trying to do everything in your own strength. That is, that is, it is a possibility to have a Christian confession. And to believe that Jesus is real. Believe that he died for your sins. Believe that he raised from the dead. Believe that the Holy Spirit has come to make his home inside of you. And believe that one day you're going to get to heaven. It's true. I'm not taking anything away from that thing from that at all because that's salvation it's it's it but salvation is deeper than just getting out of here salvation isn't just your get out of hell free card salvation is the get the hell out of you free card because in Romans 7 he talks about Therefore, it's no longer me that's doing it, but it's sin in me that's doing it. For my life, my body is dead because of sin. 
but alive because of Jesus. But Paul is referring to people that know the law and they're trying to perform the law in their own strength. And in your own strength, there is no flesh that will be gratified. There'll be no flesh that is able to fulfill the law, period. So you'll live this double lifestyle. So you'll have a confession, you'll come to church, but you'll be a hypocrite. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I, I'm telling you that I know that you don't want to be one. See, I know that, see, the grace of God comes not to make you more of a hypocrite, but the grace of God comes because grace is a teacher. Grace teaches us that denying the ungodly lust, denying ungodliness, and, and hoping for this day when Jesus returns, and hoping for this, but Christ is in you that is the hope of glory. But if you never understand what you gave yourself to, you will have all these outbursts of wrath, rage, anger, malice, slander, all that stuff which is the fruit of the flesh. It's the fruit of sin. It is the fruit of sin nature. That thing needs killed and the only way that dies is you move beyond your confession and you move into intimacy. So I'm not beating anybody up. People sometimes they get attitudes because they think I'm pointing the finger at you. I'm not. I'm putting the finger at truth. Because it's the truth that sets you free. But truth isn't just a confession. Truth is a life and a relationship with the truth. In the truth. To where your life becomes a living epistle. Known and read by all people. That everywhere you go, they know that you're walking. And they don't know what it is. But it's like the word is walking amongst them. Are you with me? Please don't be upset at me. Because what you say is you'd be upset at God. Really, and if you are, I still love you. And you don't have to love me back. I do, I really do. Is this making any sense? Trying to make it easy. See, the fornication thing, why does it happen? Why does it happen in the church? Why does fornication happen? Why do people enter into sexual relationships with people outside of covenant? Here's why. And, and Christians that, that have said yes to Jesus. Yep, we're, we're going to talk about it a little. It's okay. I'm not pointing a finger at you and saying you're bad. It's not about bad. It's not about. It's about a lack of relationship. That's all. See, because here's what happens in fornication, in idolatry, in covetousness, and all that stuff. What happens is you make something else God. So what we do if I don't have relationship is I live by my feelings. And it, it, it's, it's okay for me to do that. God forgives me. Watch. The truth is, is that Jesus says, he who, he who loves me obeys my commandments. I'm not being mean, I'm being true. So here's the deal. Jesus said, he who loves me obeys my commandments. He who doesn't love me doesn't. Okay, so, so fornication is an act of the flesh that's not in submission to the spirit. But fornication isn't something to where I'm trying to beat you up and get you in the headlock. See, the problem is, is that when somebody sleeps with somebody, they feel better about themselves, but it's only until that moment, and then after that moment's over, you feel horrible about yourself, and you have to do it again to feel good about yourself. Come on, I'm being, I'm being for real. This is real grace. This isn't, I'm not angry. God, like, God's not ready to beat you. He loves you. But when you see his love, it changes everything. I wasn't even planning on going here, but it's a really good subject. It is. See, why? Why is addiction prevalent in the church? Here's why. Because the body of Christ, the body of Christ is trying to learn who she is. But if she never gets alone and learns from Jesus. See, you can disciple somebody all day, but they have to be the one to say, I submit, I surrender, I want all of you, God. Are you with me? So I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just telling you, these acts of the flesh, the only way that they get crushed is when sin consciousness gets kicked out and sun consciousness enters in. The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from every dead work in order to serve God. That's what it says. Are you with me? So with drugs, with alcohol, with whatever, whatever I put before God, with pornography, whatever, whatever I put before God, the reason why it has a, a draw to me, and I have a draw to it, well, first of all, the enemy always wants you to pursue everything else but Jesus. 
So, so as we go after that, it gives this self-gratification thing, but it also gives this feeling that I'm worth it. Like a magazine opened to a woman that doesn't even know you. A magazine opened. Oh, some of you are looking away. Not because you're reading the magazines, but because we don't like to talk about this stuff. Well, somebody better. So a magazine that's open to a woman that doesn't even know you. The enemy can cause you to think that she likes you. Which is deception, man. Come on, this is just weird. And the only reason that I would be drawn to a magazine to see a woman that I think might like me is because I don't know that my father loves me. That's not bad, that's true. That's just good Bible truth. She doesn't know you. And she doesn't know who she is because if she did, she wouldn't be in there. Are you with me? This is really good stuff. See, if your mind doesn't get set on what God thinks about you, this will be appealing. The internet. When no one's looking. Oh, here they come. It's elite. But man, see, God sees it all. You know he's not in heaven going, man, you wait until. He's not thinking that. He's thinking, oh, child. If you would just know that you're my treasure. If you would just know that you're my treasure. You're my pearl of great price. I paid such a price for you. Oh, God. That's how our father thinks. It's, it's crazy. Oh, if they would just know. If they would just know. The only reason people press into that is because they don't know who God says they are. And the devil blinds the eyes of people lest they should see the glory of God. What does that mean? It is about people seeing the glory of God as they look in the Bible. But what I'm talking about right now is people seeing the glory of God when they look at you. I'm talking about people seeing the glory of God when they look at you. When they see you, they see His glory. They see His goodness. They see somebody that really loves Jesus. You know, one of the worst things that I hear as I travel all around the world (coughs) is, Todd White, you're the real deal. That's one of the hardest things for me. It really is. And it sounds like, why? Well, that means that if I'm a real deal, there are people out there that aren't. Todd, you're the real deal. And a lot of times we base that because we got hurt at churches or we base that because we got hurt here or hurt there or somebody let us down and they watch a sermon and they're like, man, you're the real deal, man. You're the real deal. Like, you are the real deal. I'm thinking to myself, you're the real deal. Like, you're the real deal. All I am, here's what I am. I love preaching the gospel. I love teaching. I love hearing the Father. But I love being a son more than any of it all. No matter what. I don't gain who I am because I got 100,000 people to preach to. I gain who I am because the price that was paid for me never changes the blood of Jesus is never coagulating on the mercy seat and the reality of Jesus never changes and the price that was paid for me determines my value and my value is extreme I'm like prime real estate that's everybody here you are prime real estate regardless of the muck and the dirt that you were hidden in because the treasure is buried So your buried treasure, but the Lord gave up everything. Heaven went bankrupt to get you out. And he dug and dug and dug and he got you out. Dusted off the top, flipped it open. Wow! It's the truth. It is true. So the first part of the scripture is right there. You give your life to Jesus, he forgives you. It's amazing. And all of a sudden the treasure's open. Now... Here's where you come in. You now see this amazing thing 
that you are, you see your identity, what God paid a price for you to do, the only thing you could do is offer everything you are. It's really, there's nothing else. All God's asking you for is something you were never created to be to begin with. You weren't created for you, you were created for Him. So all God's asking you to do is give up something you were never created to be. That's pretty simple. That's not much. I'm just going to give up this life of tragic mess, this tragedy, this trash that I've created because of my life of sin. I'm giving it all up. I'm going to sell everything I've got, everything that I've got to have this one thing. And all it is is relationship. It's powerful, man. Are you guys with me? All right. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, an idol putting something before the Father. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And he says, these are the things that you used to walk in when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Get it out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and you put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. This is fruit that comes from knowing who you are in Christ. It's really that simple. It's really not technical. It, the only reason the other stuff exists is because we fail to surrender and push all our chips to the center of the table and say yes to Jesus. Man, there's a bunch of bummed out people that are looking at me with sad faces. Put a smile on your face. Come on, man. I, I heard a lady say this one time. Ruth Cashman. Remember her? Jack's mom. She's at, a, she's at an elderly home. She's sharing the gospel with, with, at a convalescent home. And there's probably 60 people there. She says, are you all happy about Jesus? She said, well, then send a message to your face. I thought, man, that's good. Like, really? (laughs) Because there's a lot of people that wear life on their face, man. Yeah. Mercy, kindness, humility, long-suffering. Therefore, as God's... As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anybody has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. Boy, that's a command. That's not a question. That's not a request. That's a command. I pray that all of you leaving has Jesus land on you. Intensely. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, or dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Jackie, submit to your husband, Todd. (laughs) I'm just kidding. That's really been a twisted scripture, man, that men have used to get their own way. Don't do it. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for her. Why would a wife love her husband that can't love her like the church that just wants her to submit for, to him to, for selfish purposes husbands be very careful about using other scriptures that go along the same line with getting your wife to perform in a place that's outside of love be very careful 
I'm just going to rest on this one right here. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That means that whatever I do, whatever I put my hand to, wherever I'm at, wherever I travel, wherever I say, all the time, constantly, doing everything is under the Lord. Can I share a testimony with you? You guys good? You all right? All right, good. Lift the weight of this a little. But I pray that conviction just stays there. Conviction and condemnation are two totally different things. When somebody's in a relationship that they shouldn't be in, and someone brings up fornication, you can get an attitude because you want to have your cake and you want to eat it too. Or you can be convicted and say, God, I don't want to live this way anymore. And submit and surrender to God. Or you can be condemned and keep doing it. But relationship brings conviction. Conviction then leads to obedience, which maintains a clean conscience. Sonship is relationship to where the Father convicts me of something that shouldn't happen. And I don't just step into it. I actually pull back from it. And I flee from youthful lust. My relationship with God is amazing. And when something's not right, the Holy Spirit warns me. Because senses become trained to discern between both good and evil. Because your senses become trained in righteousness. And all of a sudden, when something's not okay, the Holy Spirit in me shakes and trembles me and lets me know something's not okay. And then all of a sudden, obedience follows. You don't step into that. Therefore, you don't condemn your conscience and your conscience remains clean. You can't afford to have a dirty conscience and go through life. You will live a life of condemnation, guilt, and shame. And you will do things that you don't want to do, say things you don't want to say. We can't afford to be so vocal about what we don't want to happen. We can't afford to just say what we want to say outside of the mind of Christ. Okay. So uh, recently, we did this Awakening Europe thing, which was ridiculous. And I'll get into that in just a second. But I want to share a, a trip that was prior to that, where I actually flew over to Poland. And I was going from Poland to Norway to Switzerland. And I was going to do 32 meetings in 10 days. That's cruising, man. But I'm on my first trip to Poland, and I'm, I'm just, I'm on, I'm on the aircraft, I'm on a couple of aircrafts. So while I'm there, there's a guy that's sitting over here that won't talk to me. And I'm talking to the airline attendants and all that, but there's a guy here that I need to talk to because he's beside me. The people beside me have to talk to me. <laughs> and you can't pull that I don't speak your language thing because I'll find out what you got, and I've got an application on my phone that translates every language. So I'll find out. Even though it's a girl's voice, you'll understand what I'm saying. It's called I Translate. It's awesome. Sometimes I get the Wi-Fi service just so I can have my translator active. Because it's worth it to me to pay $10 on a flight to be able to speak to people with different languages. So I'm on this flight, and this guy doesn't speak a different language, but I'm talking to him, and he's ignoring me. And I'm like, this is crazy. So that doesn't work for a long time. I'm talking to airline attendants and just blessing them and different stuff and he looks at me and he goes you know I used to be like that I said man thank God you talk (laughs) I said how are you he said I'm doing good man and I started to share I shared my heart with him I shared my heart on what I just shared with 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 you guys over the last couple days and he's like wow man that's that's awesome praise God to hear this I said, yeah, man, I just travel. And I get to, he goes, well, I, I know you travel and you preach the gospel, but this is different. You're on a plane. I said, yeah, but I got to tell everybody, man, it's good news. And I'm locked in a steel tube at 35,000 feet. I can't just keep it to myself. I'll explode. He's like, no, this is really good. This is really good stuff. Thank you for sharing with me today. I said, can I pray with you? He's like, oh, I got to do some stuff. I said, all right. So he did some stuff. And then right before we got off the plane, I said, why are you here? And he said he was just flying to, take some, to get somebody somewhere. And he's flying home, like, in a couple hours. He's flying back. I'm like, you flew the whole way over here? It just takes... I said, man, that's really awesome. He goes, no, I just want to make sure that these people get their, um, 
get there on time and all this. And I said, what do you do? He said, he works for the airline. I said, no way. I said, I got friends that work for this airline, man. That's awesome. I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm in there. I'm in, head, I'm in headquarters kind of like, and he works with the, at the main place that the, head, that the airlines with. I said, man, I said, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you so much. He goes, no, he goes, I really appreciate this more than you, more than you know. I said, awesome, man, give me a hug, gave him a hug, and I started my trip. I got off, Warsaw, Poland. He got off, but he was waiting to get back on to go to where he had to go. So I meet this guy, this chance encounter on, on the airplane, because everybody is, it's, first of all, I believe 100% that everything is orchestrated by the Lord, that every encounter is orchestrated. I do not have to pray for a divine encounter. I believe I am one. I honestly, I don't, I don't believe I have to pray for an encounter. I just need to be aware of my father more, more than aware of the things of this world. And so I get off the plane and I go to the people pick me up and I've got, uh, I've got an hour to get changed to get to my meeting and it's on, right? Pretty awesome. I'm going to speak to a bunch of leaders. But when I check into the hotel, I get to the hotel and I said, I said, I'm in Poland. And I, I asked, you know, if she spoke English. And, and working in a hotel, they're required to speak uh, uh, at least English anyway, thank God. But I have my translator just in case she doesn't. So I'm talking to her and I, I'm telling her her value. And she looks at me and she's like, I, I, I'm having trouble right now. And I said, hold on, you're, you're okay. Let me pray for you. She goes, and she starts to like manifest this thing at the hotel desk. She goes, I, I have to go. And she runs in the back, bursts into tears. She's in the back, she's crying. She's not even coming out front. I'm like, that's crazy. Another guy steps up, but he's from Africa and he loves Jesus. And I'm talking to him about Jesus. And, wow, this is awesome. And I'm telling him why I'm here. And he's like, have you ever been to Poland before? I said, no, haven't ever been. So here's what happened. Check this out. Remember I said that God goes before you, right? So, so I'm in Poland, and I've never been there before. I've never, I've never been to Warsaw. And I'm there, and they planned this meeting, and they were going to do this meeting at a church that held 300 people. Because they said, you know, we, this is your first time here. We want to, you know, try to figure out, you know, what kind of a place we should get. And it was just these different pastors from different churches that wanted to plan it. And so we planned it, and then they said, we'll have people register just so we can gauge what's going on. So the church filled in a day, like with registrations, which is pretty cool. And I'm not boasting in me, because I've never been there, man, right? But what God's doing, the hunger that He's increasing all over the earth. So then all of a sudden, they're like, well, let's try to get this next place. It seats 900. So when they opened it up for registration, 1,900 people registered. So now they have a problem, right? He's like, we've never seen it. We, we need to get a bigger place. So they ended up renting this other place that could hold like 4,500 people in it. And they had to go out and rent chairs and all, this whole, this is a big deal. Anyway, it was really cool because this was in a matter of like two months. Like all this started to like, and I'm like going there, but God's prepping it. So I go to the meeting and pour into to leaders and pastors. There's about 300 leaders there and pastors from I get up on stage and none of them have ever heard me I mean maybe like 10 but we're talking about I'm in a very very conservative nation that is predominantly Catholic and these priests and people are at the meeting and I'm like for me it's awesome I love it but I'm just like I just know what people are thinking and I like it I'm okay with that because I know who I am I know I know him. I know my lo the love I have for him and the love God has for me. So I'm just sharing my heart and it's amazing. And bunches of leaders and pastors get saved. It's like crazy awesome. So then I go back to the hotel and, and I check in. That girl's not there. And I go back the next day and I talk to, I talk to, to hotel people down in the gym just talking to people. Uh, trainers are getting saved and, and just born again. And, uh, it's amazing. The stuff that's happening there. It's just awesome. And I go out and do my first meeting. And I, my first meeting, I like usually in the day meetings, right? I, I, not to be disrespectful, Pastor Dan calls them short long pants. I wear shorts, they're about down to here. Because I do a lot of day meetings. Like, I mean a lot. My schedule's intense. And I ask them if it would be okay. Oh, it would be wonderful. I'm like, thanks, man. Are you sure? Oh, it would be great. And I'm like, all right. Well, that was coming from somebody that wants to break religion in Poland. 
And okay. So I get up there, and it's my first meeting. There's 4,500 people packing this house, and I've got shorts on. And I wasn't trying to be in rebellion. I asked a few people. They were all like, oh, yes, we were fine. I'm like, well, why don't you have shorts on? Oh, it's okay. You're from America. Everything is fine. I wasn't trying to be. I would never try to do that to hurt a culture of a place, ever. I wear ties. I've even worn jackets. So, so I get in there, and all of a sudden there's all these people. And I, I don't know the, the, the dominant religion there yet, because I'm just coming into their culture. Never been there. But I start my meeting out, and all these people are there. I said, I've got good news and bad news for you. And they're like, I said, what do you want first? And there's an interpreter. They said, the good news. I'm like, all right. I said, his name is Jesus. And I start sharing just the love of God and Jesus. And I said, I've got bad news. I'm like, okay. I said, if you've put your hope, and if you've put your trust, and if you've put your faith in Mary to save you, you will go to hell. I wasn't being mean. It's the truth, because your faith must be in Jesus. I'm not taking anything against or anything away from the mother. But the truth is, is that it is about Jesus. And then I said, but I've got more news for you that's good. And I shared about a Christian. And my first message was about a Christian that is supposed to be just like Mary so pregnant with Jesus that they have to deliver him everywhere they go. It is powerful. And three quarters of my meeting got saved. The first service. It's just amazing, right? So God is there before you. And he's touching people. And I got to train them in eight sessions in identity after they got saved. And then we had a huge fire tunnel where I laid hands on thousands of people and it was beautiful amazing okay on to the hotel so I get to the hotel and this girl is there again she sees me come in she starts to walk away I said, whoa 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 stop where are you going she goes no she goes I, I'm not going anywhere she goes I, I really need to talk to you I go thank God I said because that thing that happened the other day you didn't need to run away she said no she goes I, I just I had trouble looking in your eyes there's a problem with your eyes and I said, Ken, first of all, can I pray for you? She was okay. So I prayed for her. She was fine. She was all right. She goes, I need to tell you something. I said, what? She goes, well, she goes, the week before you came here, she said, I have, I have to take, I, I think she said it's like 20 kilometers to get to her house, and to, or to get to her parents' house from where she lives. She, she took a cab. So she said, I go to the cab. I get in the cab to go. And when I get in there, I sit in there, and I just, I just want to be left alone. I have to go to my parents' house, and I'm not happy about this. I'm like, oh, wow. And I didn't ask her why she wasn't happy, but she said, the cab driver says, what do you believe? She goes, uh, what do you mean, what do I believe? And the cab driver says, do you believe in Jesus? She don't want to hear about Jesus. She goes, Really, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I have to go to my house, and my father is going to beat the Bible on my head. I don't want to hear about Jesus. And the cabbie turns around and goes, he's a Muslim that got saved. Cabbie. Told her, her encou his encounter with Jesus. And he says, he said, Jesus believes in you. And he's got, she's got all these miles or these kilometers to drive, right? So right before she gets out of the car, the cabbie says to her, there is a man that is coming to our nation to share about this lovely Jesus. He's got dreadlocks. <laughs> His name is Todd White. She said, yesterday when you checked in, she said, I looked at the name and I looked at you. Why would God send you to my hotel? Why would a cab driver tell me about you and here you are? She said, I am completely freaked out right now. 
she's shaking. I said, God, love for you. And just shared the love of God for her. She was so overwhelmed with Jesus. She, she, she actually, the people that were with me followed up with her and are still following up with this woman at the hotel that brought me to, brought me to Poland. But God's way ahead of this thing. Way ahead. Like even over there, just far away. So I want to share one more testimony with you that has to do with the back end of this. Are you ready? Okay. So my wife and I were getting, and we had amazing meetings in Norway and Switzerland, and it was just powerful, all kinds of stuff. My wife and I got to go. She got to go with me. She's getting to go on, on, on more trips with me, which is exciting. But we got to go to this event called Awakening Europe. Now, Awakening Europe was something that I had a vision of in February, and a friend of mine, in February of 2014, where we were in Nuremberg, Germany, and I actually saw the very place that Hitler equipped, and he went after the youth, the young adults in, in, of Germany, that I actually saw the same place that Hitler did what he did to be actually brought back to me that's the great ground to redeem for the Lord because it was great tragedy that didn't just cloud up Germany but it clouded up whole all of Europe like twisted everything he was a liar he promised everything and gave nothing and, and it was just horrible so we said we're gonna do this so what had happened was they got this the stadium in Nuremberg the Nuremberg Stadium and when we got there there were 26,000 people that came to be a part of this. There was 153 different nations that came together to be a part of this. And it was a worship service for the Lord. And you can watch it. God TV was there, but it was ridiculous. And, and I'm, I mean ridiculous. It was one of the most powerful things I've ever been a part of. Ever. And it was these days. I got to lead an outreach of like 20,000 people. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. They're baptizing people in fountains and rivers and people were coming out of wheelchairs out in public everywhere. Like like I'm talking about people being healed, people coming out of wheelchairs, blind eyes were opening, deaf ears were opening in Europe. In Europe. It, it's crazy. Awesome. But one of the most profound things to me was this. And this was just crazy. Um, it's the, I think it was the end of the conference or the end of the, the stadium event. It was just so powerful. We're sitting there in the stands and, and we're at a place where they wanted us to, to have our, to have, um, you know, in the, when you see the arena, you have boxes that you have for sports and stuff. We're kind of in a box, but we're outside, right? And the security, um, intense, like the security there. So a lady comes up, crawling across these chairs to get up to me. And she said, I need to talk to you. She says, Todd White. She says, I need to thank you. And I said, for what? what, what you, what's happening? And like, no one saw her get up there. It was really cool. She goes, you were on a plane to Poland months and months ago. <laughs> you remember? She says to me, she goes, there was a man that was beside you on the plane that didn't want to talk to you. She said, I want to tell you the history of that man. And I go, all right. So she says, I'm from Switzerland. She's from Switzerland. This man, nine years ago, was my spiritual father in Switzerland. He brought Jesus to me. He showed me who Jesus was. He walked and he fell away from God. And he's been angry at God and no one's found him. No one's known where, is he, where he's at. She said that, I'm going to read you. So she read me this quote off of Facebook. It was the day that he got to the airport, in the airport, before he took his plane ride home. He said, I met a man on the plane today. <laughs> he showed me who Jesus would have been like on a plane. He said, I ran away from God because I blamed him for things he never did. But he showed me through his life what Jesus would have walked like on a plane. He said, so today I gave my life back to Jesus on the plane.
for me, this is so powerful because it touch people every day. But you, you don't get to hear the back end of stuff a lot of times. But this was a trip to Poland that I had never been at. And I'm on a plane and care about a guy that can't, doesn't want to talk to me. He's trying to avoid eye contact the whole He does not want me around him. He's just trying to be left alone. But I can't leave him alone because his soul's at stake, see? Because I know who I am. But this is another trip. This is Poland. And I go through my days and go through that. A, a, a lady at the front desk gets touched by a cab driver that said that Todd White's coming to the city. That I go and check in at her hotel. She gets totally freaked out. And Jesus touches her heart and overwhelms her life. So many other people. I mean, so many other people. But just these two people. God is intricately involved in your life. And He knows everything that you say. Everything that you do. He sees everywhere that you go. He knows everything about you. He has every hair on your head numbered. The thoughts that God has for you outnumbers the grains of sand in the whole world. And every thought is for your welfare. Every morning when you wake up, His mercies are new and fresh. And all He wants us to do is believe. Because that's just two examples. But this guy was off. He was twisted. He was whacked. But was a powerful leader that just went sidetracked. This girl comes up to me and says, We've been searching for him for nine years and haven't been able to find him. And he's on fire because you cared about somebody on a plane in Poland. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you for your life. This ridiculous man. What's that worth to you? What's it worth to you for one person? What is it worth for you to have one person be changed and transformed? What would it be worth for you? What would it be worth for you? Come on. What would it be worth for you? One person. One person. To know that they're not just a number. To know that they're not just no value. To know that they are a son. Because you're a son and you know who you are. Come on. All I'm here to do is take out the trash, man. Take out the trash so we can really sing no more shackles, no more chains. But actually, like, we can live that way, no more shackles, no more chains every day. If you're here, if you're here, and you felt like your life got sidetracked, And this did something in your heart today. I just want you to stand up right where you're at, please. You're not going to come forward. I'm just going to, I want you to stand up. If you're here, and this is something where you just, you want to be that one. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for a rethinking a rethinking with the mind of Christ God I thank you in Jesus name for the wrecking ball of our life God that we can wreck the devil's kingdom everywhere we go God I thank you for the reality of a life that's set ablaze for you God I thank you for anybody that has drifted away for anybody that the fire has just gone out in that God you would reignite the flame reignite the flame God Reignite the flame. God, that we could burn clean and free of all debris. That we could burn with the glory of heaven. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for a church that's a fire-breathing church, God. A fire-breathing church, God. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. If you've got any kind of sickness or disease in your body right now, I need you to stand up. Any kind of sickness and disease in your body at all. Anything physically that is tormenting your body right now any kind of health issue no matter what it is whether it's breathing heart conditions ear conditions necks whatever it is 
knees, ankles, elbows, shoulders, anything. Look, as I name these things, people stand up. I said anything. Come on. I'm not saying you have to complain about it. Jesus, come on. Would everybody put their hand on somebody right now? Please. Jesus. Jesus. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. Jesus' name. God, I thank you for physical healing all over this house. Every cell, God, in the name of Jesus, God, every cell. God, thank you for wholeness right now. In Jesus' name, lungs be clear. In Jesus' name, right now, every breathing condition be healed. In Jesus' name, hearts be healed. Physical hearts be made whole. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you. Complete wholeness, God. I thank you for physical healing for everyone here. Brand new joints, brand new right now. Brand new shoulders, necks, brand new God. Brand new discs in the neck and in the back. Be healed right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for complete healing, complete wholeness right now. Jesus' name God, brand new. Brand new. Brand new ankles. In Jesus' name, ankles be healed right now. Knees be healed in the name of Jesus. Some of you are like, I've already been prayed for. It hasn't happened. Father, thank you that today your mercies are new every day, right now, today, in Jesus' name. Every digestive disorder, get out of this room right now. Get out of this house. In the name of Jesus, God. Wholeness. 100% healing. Every allergy, get out in Jesus' name. Right now, every headache and chronic headaches, chronic fatigue, get out in Jesus' name. Brand new, Father, thank you for wholeness, God. In Jesus' name. Brand new. Jesus, brand new. Father, I thank you for any kind of disease that is in the body from yesterday's sin. That means hep C, drug diseases, sexually transmitted diseases. In the name of Jesus, we command them all to go. Jesus' name. Blood be healed. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for wholeness the whole way through. In Jesus' name, right now. I want everybody in this room to check your body physically. To check whatever you can check in your body to see if you see change. Check it right now. Uh, Everybody should be moving around. Anybody was standing and got prayer right now. I want you to check. If it was a shoulder, check it. it If it was your wrist, move them. Fingers, joints of any kind, right now. If there is any change whatsoever, wave both hands above your head right now. Wave both hands above your head. Do it again. Both hands above your head real high. There's change. That's awesome. One more time. I want everybody to put your hand on somebody. Shoulders, men. I want right now, I want you to pray for the person on your left or on your right. Somebody should be around somebody right now. Everybody should be around somebody. And I want you to just command their body to be healed right now. It's not bossing, you're not bossing God around. You're just commanding what shouldn't be there to get out, that's all. You don't have to shout at it. But commanding, Jesus, Jesus didn't have to shout at anything. The devils knew the voice of Jesus. 
and his voice is in us we as the body of Christ we command this to go in Jesus name thank you Father in Jesus name God brand new wholeness 100% and complete physical healing in Jesus name I thank you Father in the name of Jesus right now thank you Father that sleeping disorders would go and never return in the name of Jesus God thank you brand new Jesus name I thank you Father for a brand new kidney right now in Jesus name Jesus name right now brand new kidney Jesus name Jesus name every disease cancer leukemia diabetes every disease we command it to go in Jesus name and never return thank you father Jesus name God thank you Okay, right now, again, one more time. I want everybody to physically check anything they can right now. Everybody in this building, I want you to check and see. If it's your ankle, check it. Stomp on your foot, check it. If it's your toes, move it. If it's your fingers, whatever it is, physically, right now, if you can check. Try to do something that was hard for you to do before. Everybody's just standing at me. That was hard for you to do. (laughs) All right. Right now, show of hands for change in your body right now. From the first time we prayed to now. Right now. A physical healing in your body right now. I want show of hands, double hands over your head like this. Of everybody that had something change in their body right now. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this again tonight. We're going to pray for healing again. And we're going to believe for major breakthrough tonight. We're going to believe. I just, I just have something really on my heart. And I, I, I kind of wanted to share it a little bit even now. So I have a. But it's, it's about fire. And it's about a life of fire. So I just here's what I want to do. I, I, wanna, I want you guys to come. As many as can come. If you can come, I really want you to come back. All right? But I'm going to give this to Pastor Chuck. I'm going to pray over you one more time. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for grace, for mercy, for overwhelming love, God. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done. And I thank you for what you're going to do tonight. I thank you for the healing of family members, God. For family members being made whole. For proxy prayers that even when we were praying right now, there were people that were thinking about a family member in proxy. That even right now, that family member right now would manifest healing no matter where they live in this world. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God. And everybody said, Amen. 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 